Hello everybody and welcome to a new video from Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth Today on the 6th of August 2016 I record this one Because this is a summary of the book Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow And today uh, on the 6th of August 2016 I uploaded the last chapter 21 A mixture of the, myst uh, of the mystery um, to my main channel, Juggler66, and I already have a long time prepared the summary, so after watching that last chapter, I thought that's a good time to record the summary today. The video that will be running in the meantime while I'm speaking this is just a compilation of all the pictures I used making all the videos of Babylon Mystery Religion and the pictures I used up to now in the video, or almost all the pictures I used up to now in the two Babylons from Alexander Hislop, which I'm reading in German. So I really did not make many work, much work of that video, but compile just a lot of pictures, all having to do, of course, with the subjects that were whether addressed in these books or addressed in my comments. So it's better you pay attention to the spoken word than to the pictures, but even though the pictures are quite nice, I think. Um, anyway, um, this summary was not written by myself, but a, a former brother in Christ sent me this some years ago via an email, and I kept it all these years and just going to read it to you without probably making too many comments on my own. And also, when I cite the scriptures that is, uh, which is mentioned in the summary here, like, uh, book, like from the book of Revelation, Isaiah, Jeremiah, or wherever we go to, I will not read the Bible verses because that has all been done in the book reading itself. This is just a summary. So let's see how far this takes us because it's quite uh, extensive. But that's the idea of a summary, to give you really an overview of the subjects dealt with in the book, the Babylon Mystery Religion. And don't forget, this is a book that Ralph Woodrow recanted on, and the recanting video is also to be found in the playlist after it's uploaded. I don't know which one comes out first, the summary or that one, but that's also already done, and it will be uploaded in the playlist, Babylon Mystery Religion. Just check, check the playlist, and you will find that there. Anyway, let's start. Babylon Mystery Religion, a summary. All roads lead to Babylon. Uh, yeah, I'm going to read another book from uh, Michael de Semlian in, uh, in the future, which is called All Roads Lead to Rome. And of course, when you know Babylon Mystery Religion, you know that Rome comes from Babylon. So you can actually say All Roads Lead to Babylon, which is quite the same as All Roads Lead to Rome. Huh? There are only two religions. First, the truth of the Almighty, as expressed in his word, the Bible. And you know that I rely on the authorized version of 1611 King James Bible. And second, every other belief. That means actually every other belief. Whether you believe in Islam, whether you believe in Hinduism, whether you believe in Buddhism, whether you believe in Roman Catholicism, it doesn't matter. Everything else but revealed in the truth of Almighty, in His Word, the Bible, every other belief than that is religion, man-made belief. And those are the only two that exist. And Satan does not care which one you believe, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Roman Catholicism, as long as you do not believe the true word of the Almighty. These two religions cannot be mixed without disastrous results. Babylon is the source of false religion, as we can read in Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. When John wrote the Revelation, Babylon as a city had already been destroyed and left in ruins as Old Testament prophets had foretold, as you can check in Isaiah chapter 13 verses 19 through 22 and Jeremiah in the chapters 51 and 52. Though the city of Babylon was destroyed, its religious concepts and customs had spread around the world. Today's myriad of false religions have their origin in ancient Babylon. Ralph Woodrow, in his book Babylon Mystery Religion, which is first published in 1966 and is now out of print because of his recantation of the book, he 
pulled it from the market, it will never appear on the market again, clearly traces the practices and teachings of ancient Babylon and their modern counterparts in the Roman Catholic Church and her Protestant daughters. Babylonian ideas are by no means isolated to professing Christianity. Since nominal Christianity is so permeated with false doctrines from Babylon, we should carefully study this problem so as to avoid Babylonianism. Today, there is an almost irresistible tide in the Church of God to turn aside to ideas of Babylon. All too many believers are taking one out of the many roads of Rome and Babylon. Here is a summary of Woodrow's excellent book, Babylon Mystery Religion, starting with uh, Nimrod and Semiramis, which is the first chapter called Babylon, Source of False Religion. Legends are difficult to prove. They are almost impossible to disprove. Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, which also means against the Lord, was the first to organize cities into a kingdom under human rule, as we can read in Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. This much we know from the Bible. The name Nimrod comes from the word Marat, meaning he rebelled. Legend has it that Nimrod married his own mother, Semiramis. After Nimrod died, Semiramis claimed Nimrod was the sun, S-U-N, God. She later had a child, Tammuz, whom she claimed was Nimrod reborn, supernaturally conceived, the promised seed, the quote-unquote savior. Semiramis developed a religion of mother and child worship. Symbols were used to develop a mystery religion. Since Nimrod was believed to be the sun god, Baal, fire was considered his earthly representation. In other forms, Nimrod was symbolized by S-U-N sun images, by fish, by trees, by pillars and other animals. Tammuz, son of the S-U-N sun god, was represented by the golden calf. And so it was that mankind followed this religion of worshipping the creation, the creature rather than the creator, as we can read in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 26. Whether or not the Nimrod, Semiramis, Tammuz legends are completely historical or not is immaterial. The result of these legends is that mankind in general has followed variations of one kind or another of the religion of Babylon to this day. Rome, the greatest and longest-lived human world ruling empire, assimilated religions from her, <coughs> from her many conquered territories. All these religions had commonalities, for they all came from Babylon. These practices infiltrated and overcame the professing Christian church, which later came to be dominated by Rome itself. Now we go into the second chapter, which is called Mother and Child Worship, Mary Worship, very important part of this. Pictures are worth more than thousand words. If you doubt the common origin of many pagan practices, pictures showing the striking similarity should convince you. Many pagan religions had mother and child worship, whether Divaki and Krishna in India, Isis and Horus in Egypt, Venus or Fortuna and Jupiter in Rome, etc. Each nation gave different names to essentially the same god or goddess. A mother goddess or quote-unquote queen of heaven was said to have given miraculous birth to a son. Ancient Israel sometimes followed this false religion, as we can read in the book of Judges, chapter 2, verse 13, chapter 10, verse 6, 1 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 3 through 4, chap uh, 12 and, uh, chapter 12 and 10, and in the first book of Kings, chapter 11, verse 5, and in the second book of Kings, chapter 23, verse 13, and also in Jeremiah, chapter 44, verses 17 through 19, and if I'm not mistaken, Jeremiah, chapter 7, because there are five mentionings of the Queen of Heaven in the book of Jeremiah altogether, with disastrous results. In Ephesus, 
Semiramis was worshipped as the great mother Diana, the many-breasted goddess. This form of mother-child worship was followed throughout all Asia and the world, as we can read for confirmation in the word of God in the book of Acts, chapter 19, verse 27. Mary worship had no place in the early Christian church. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia, under the article Virgin Mary, admits that in the first centuries AD there are no traces of the worship of Mary. By the fourth century, the time of Emperor Constantine, worshipping Mary as a goddess and offering cakes at her shrine began to come into the professing church. In AD 431, the Council of Ephesus made Mary worship official. By mixing beliefs already being practiced, Diana of Ephesus worshipped as a goddess, with nominal Christianity, so-called church fathers, reasoned that they could gain more converts. It is the same old story. Apostates believe that lowering God's standards result in a better form of religion, more acceptable and popular to the masses. The Bible is clear that there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ, as we can read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Yet, Roman Catholicism teaches that Mary is also a quote-unquote mediator. Catholics offer prayers to Mary, burn candles to Mary, and have statues of Mary, which come directly from their pagan counterparts. Isis, the Egyptian goddess, was known as quote-unquote mother of God, just as Mary is titled by Catholics. Oegel, in The Paganism in Our Christianity, on page 129, says, quote, When Christianity triumphed, these paintings and figures became those of the Madonna and Child, without any break in continuity. No archaeologist, in fact, can now tell whether some of these objects represent the one or the other. Unquote. In pagan religion, the mother was worshipped as much, or more even, than her son. Noted Roman Catholic writer Alphonsus Liguori stressed that prayers addressed to Mary are much more effectual than to Christ himself. Mary is deified as the quote-unquote Queen of Heaven, born without sin, which means immaculate conception of the mother. The quote, Mother of God, unquote, exactly as pagan worshippers deified Isis, Venus, Ashtoreth, Kibele, etc. Jesus did not teach that Mary was superior to other human beings. When someone mentioned his mother and brethren, Jesus asked, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? Then, stretching forth his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Unquote. And you can read in conf for confirmation in the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. Anyone who does the will of God is on the same level as Mary. Closely associated with praying to Mary is the rosary, a chain of 15 sets of small beads marked off by one large bead. The ends of the chain are joined by a medal with an imprint of Mary, from which hangs a short chain with a crucifix at the end. The use of prayer, counters or rosary beads is an almost universal custom in pagan religion. From Nineveh to India to China, beads were used as a part of worship. The Phoenicians used a circle of beads resembling a rosary in the worship of Astarte, the mother goddess, as early as 800 years before Christ. Francis Xavier was astonished to see that rosaries were universally familiar to the Buddhists of Japan. Francis Xavier, remind you, was one of the forming uh, persons of, uh, of, of the forming of the Company of Jesus, Sociedad uh, Compania de Jesus, as it is originally called, the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits as we know it today. 
So Francis Xavier was astonished to see that rosaries were universally familiar to the Buddhists of Japan. Another absolutely sure sign of all so-called religion having originated in Babylon. The main prayer of the rosary is the Hail Mary. The complete rosary repeats the Hail Mary 53 times, the Lord's Prayer 6 times and several other recitations. The Hail Mary combines the statement of the angel about Mary from the Bible with unscriptural blasphemy. Quote, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. Jesus, a loose translation of Luke chapter 1 verse 28, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of death. Amen. Unquote. Mary was not the mother of God. She was not holy. She was a righteous woman who is dead in her grave, waiting for the resurrection to eternal life with all the other dead in Christ. The Catholic Encyclopedia says, quote, There is little or no trace of the Hail Mary as an accepted devotional formula before about 1050. Unquote. Article Hail Mary, page 111 in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Jesus instructs us not to use vain repetitions when we pray, when we read Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 8. The so-called Lord's Prayer, uh, verses 9 through 13, was a model prayer, not a prayer to be mon uh, monotonously repeated. Jesus said in effect, pray thus, after this manner, therefore pray ye, not pray this. Prayer should be spontaneous, not wrote memory with no heartfelt meaning. We come to the next chapter, which is called Saints, Saint Days and Symbols or Many Gods, Statues and Pictures. I will not always use the correct names of the chapters in the book, but as you see, this is a summary and we go actually through all of them. There is only one God family, composed of the Father and the Son. We have direct access to God through the blood of Jesus Christ, as we can read in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, chapter 9, verse 12, and chapter 10, verse 10. Roman Catholics honor and pray to various special saints, canonized by the church hierarchy. According to the Bible, all True Christians are saints, as we can read, among others, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. If we want a saint to pray for us, it must be a living person. If we try to commune with people that have died, this is a form of spiritism. The so-called Apostles' Creed says, quote, I believe in the communion of the saints, unquote supposing that prayers are effectual to and for the dead. Babylonian religion had a plurality of gods, some 5,000 gods and goddesses, once heroes on the earth, but now elevated on a higher spiritual plane. Every month and every day of the month was under the protection of a particular divinity. In exactly the same way, Roman Catholics have saints for almost every day of the year, for occupations, for specific problems. Saint Clare is the saint for television, Saint Denise for headaches, Saint Hadrian for butchers, etc. Now, why pray to dead saints when Christians have access directly to God? Catholics are taught that they should pray to Mary and other dead saints to obtain help that God would not otherwise give. In other words, God cannot, uh, cannot be depended upon or trusted. That's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. We should pray to Him through Mary and the saints who supposedly are more kind and loving than God Himself. In church buildings of Europe today, it is not uncommon to have two, three or four thousand statues. Those who bow and worship before statues know fully well that the statue is not God, but only representative of God. 
Catholics, like pagans, know that the statues they worship are not God. However, this excuse does not get around Exodus chapter 20 verses 4 through 5. Quote, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is underneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Unquote. The Bible instructed the ancient Israelites not to adopt the idols of pagans into the true worship of God. Quote, the graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it, in, un, uh, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord, unquote, as we can read in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 25. Israelites were to, quote, destroy all their pictures, unquote, as we can read in Numbers chapter 33, verse 52. Pagans placed a circle or aureole, a halo, a disc of the sun god, around the heads of those who were gods in their pictures. This practice continued right into the Romish church. For the first four centuries, the church used to pictures, uh, uh, sorry, for the first four centuries, the church used no pictures of Christ. Since Christ is now glorified on the right hand of the Father, no picture could come close to doing him justice. We do not need, nor should we have, statues, pictures, or representations of God and of Christ. Obelisks, Temples and Towers The Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. is modeled after an Egyptian obelisk. According to Diodorus, Queen Semiramis in Babylon erected a 130-foot tall obelisk. The obelisk was popular in Egypt associated with sun worship. The erect upright pointed column represents the phallus, the male sex organ of Baal, Nimrod. Here we see a common theme of Babylonian worship, emphasis on perverted sexuality. The Bible mentions such, quote, standing images, unquote, Matzebah. And for confirmation, you can read the first book of Kings, chapter 14, verse 23, second book of Kings, chapter 18, verse 4, and chapter 23, verse 14, Jeremiah, chapter 43, verse 13, and Micah, chapter 5, verse, verse 13, and, quote, unquote, sun images, Hamanim, as you can read in Isaiah chapter 17 verse 8 and chapter 27 verse 9. God will not forever allow these standing images to remain, but will cast them down. The quote-unquote image of jealousy erected in the entry to the temple was probably an obelisk, symbol of the phallus, as we can read in Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 5. It was common to place an obelisk at the entrance of a heathen temple, and so it is that the entrance to St. Peter's Basilica and the Vatican in Rome, there is an Egyptian obelisk. This is not a copy of an Egyptian obelisk, as is the Washington Monument. It is the same obelisk that stood in Egypt in ancient times at the pagan temple of Heliopolis, the city of the sun god. Emperor Caligula, in 37 through 41 AD, hold it from Egypt to Rome, to great expense to his circus on Vatican Hill. Heliopolis is the Greek name of the Hebrew Bethesemesh, House of the Sun, which was the center of ancient Egyptian sun worship. Obelisks that stood there are called, quote, images of Bethesemesh, unquote. Jeremiah 43 verse 13 for confirmation. In 1586, Pope Sixtus V had the 83-foot-high, 320-ton obelisk moved to the center front of St. Peter's Square, where it resides today, symbolic of the merger of Egyptian sun worship with professing Christianity. God's people do not have an edifice complex. Those who have the Holy Spirit are the temple of God, as you can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. 
There is no record of a church building as such being built prior to A.D. 225 through 235. It is not wrong to have church buildings, but false believers embellished their halls of worship with pagan spires similar to pagodas and shrines of idolatrous worshippers. There is evidence to show that the spires of our churches owe their existence to the uprights or obelisks outside the temples of former ages, as we can read from Brown in Sex, Worship and Symbolism of Primitive Races, page 38. Quote, there are still in existence today remarkable specimens of original phallic symbols, steeples on the churches and obelisks, all show the influence of our fellows worshipping ancestors, unquote. as you can read from Eichler, The Customs of Mankind, on page 55. Also, the cross is not a Christian symbol. One of the most important symbols of Catholics and Protestants is the cross. The priest makes the sign of the cross on the head of infants as they are sprinkled. Churches are built in the shape of the cross. When Catholics enter church, they take quote-unquote holy water and make the sign of the cross. During Mass, the priest makes the sign of the cross 16 times and blesses the altar with the cross 30 times. The cross is universally worn as jewelry around the neck and is prominent in professing Christian homes. Early Christians considered the cross as, quote, the accursed tree, unquote, a device of death and shame, as we can read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. They did not trust in an old rugged cross. Instead, their faith was in what was accomplished on the cross, or stake, or whatever it was Jesus was impaled upon. That is how the apostles preached about the cross, you can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. It was not until Christianity became paganized, or better said, paganism was Christianized, when the cross image came to be thought of as a Christian symbol, part of worship. Crosses in churches was introduced in AD 431. The use of crosses on steeples did not come about until about 586. The Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words says the cross originated among the Babylonians of ancient Chaldea, used as a symbol of the god Tammuz. Almost any book of ancient Egypt shows the use of the Tau cross, shaped like the letter T, on old monuments and walls of ancient temples. Seymour says that the cross, unchanged for thousands of years, quote, was reverenced among the Chaldeans, Phoenicians, Mexicans, and every ancient people of both hemispheres, unquote. In The Cross in Tradition, History and Art, page 22 and 26. The cross had been a sacred symbol of India for centuries among non-Christians. Prescott reports that when the Spaniards first landed in Mexico, they were shocked to behold the cross, sacred emblem of their own Catholic faith, reverenced in Aztec temples. A heathen temple in Palenque, Mexico, founded in the 9th century BC, was known as, quote, the Temple of the Cross, unquote. Ancient Mexicans worshipped the cross as Tota, which means Our Father, similar to apostate Israelites who worshipped a, uh, a piece of wood as my father, as we can read in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 27. In 46 BC, Roman coins show Jupiter holding a long scepter terminating in a cross. Vestal virgins, which are actually temple prostitutes of pagan Rome, wore the cross suspended from their necklaces, as Roman Catholic nuns do today. Quote, Since Jesus died on a cross, some say, doesn't that make it a Christian symbol? Unquote. Well, let us suppose he was put to death with a hatchet. Would this be a reason to venerate the hatchet? Again, the important thing is not the way Jesus died, but who died, the Son of God, and why he died, 
for the sins of all mankind. Crucifixion was a common method of execution of flagrant crimes in Egypt, Assyria, Persia, Palestine, Carthage, Greece and Rome. Seymour reports, quote, Tradition ascribes the invention of the punishment of the cross to a woman, the Queen Semiramis, unquote. Relics of Romanism Pagans regarded the cross as a protector. Ancient Italians placed a cross upon the, top, uh, upon the tombs. In like manner, uneducated professing Christians today used the cross in their homes to ward off trouble and disease. In ancient Israel, a plague of serpents afflicted the Israelites. Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole, and if anyone who was bitten by a serpent looked upon the brazen serpent, serpent they lived, as you can read in Numbers chapter 21, verse 9. Lifting up the serpent in the wilderness was a type of the way Christ would be lifted up on the stake, as you can read in John chapter 3, verse 14. After the brazen serpent had served its purpose, the Israelites kept it around and made an idol out of it. Centuries later, Hezekiah broke in pieces the brazen serpent because Israel was burning incense to it, as you can read in the second book of Kings, chapter 18, verse 1 through 4. Even items which God used for his purpose, if looked at for themselves and not for the God who used them, can become objects of idolatry. The cross has served its purpose. Jesus rose from the dead. Let us not worship the cross and other relics. Among the most venerated objects of worship are supposed relics or pieces of the cross upon which Jesus was crucified. If all the pieces were gathered together, they would fill a good-sized ship. Catholics believe that the house in which Mary lived in Nazareth is now in the little town of Loreto, Italy, having been transported there by angels. The quote-unquote holy house of Loreto is one of the most famous shrines of Italy, honored by more than 47 popes. Veneration of the dead bodies of martyrs was ordered by the Council of Trent, which condemned those who did not believe in relics. Bones are placed beneath the church in the belief that saints' bones quote-unquote consecrate the ground and building. The castle church at Wittenberg, the door of which Luther nailed his 95 Theses in 1517, had 19,000 relics of dead quote-unquote, saints. The Second Nicene Council in 787 decreed it illegal to dedicate a building if no relics were present on penalty of excommunication. Adoring the bones of the dead is a direct carryover from paganism. In legend, when Nimrod, the false savior of Babylon, died, his body was torn limb from limb and buried in various places. His resurrection to a new body, becoming the sun god, left behind his old body. This contrasts with the death of the true Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Quote, a bone of him shall not be broken, unquote, as we can read in John chapter 19, verse 36. Who was resurrected in the true sense of the word, leaving behind no body parts for relics. In the old mystery religion, bones of hero gods consecrated shrines and relics were worshipped. In God's wisdom, however, he secretly buried Moses to ensure nobody would venerate his servant Moses, as you can read in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5 through 6. So, why should we venerate bones and relics, articles of clothing, etc., of the saints? The Catholic Encyclopedia says, quote, no dishonor is done to God by the continuance of an error which has been handed down for many centuries. Hence, there is justification for the practice of the Holy See in allowing the cult of certain doubtful relics to continue. Unquote. As you can read under the article Relics in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Don't believe the religious fakery of relic worship. Of those who claim to have a bone of Joseph, some of the hair of Mary, the shroud of Turin, or what have you. 
worship God the Creator. The monks of Cheru, as well as three other churches in France, Rome and Italy, claim to have the foreskin of the baby Jesus. May the Eternal guide us to His true worship in spirit and truth, not religious lies and shady salesmanship. Pay for forgiveness of sins or suffer? Do you believe that Christ paid the penalty for all your sins? <laughs> I do. Yet Catholics believe that sins committed after infant baptism can be forgiven, quote, but there still remains the temporal punishment required by divine justice, and this requirement must be fulfilled either in the present life or in the world to come, i.e. the Roman Catholic taught purgatory. An indulgence offers the penitent sinner the means of discharging this debt during this life on earth, unquote, when you read under the article Indulgences in the Catholic Encyclopedia. The basis for indulgences, still a belief of Catholics, is the treasury of merits of Christ and the saints. However, since Christ, quote, is the propitiation for our sins, and his blood cleanses us from all sins, unquote, as you can read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, and chapter 1, verse 7, how can the merits of Mary and other saints possibly add to this? During the Middle Ages, popes authorized the mass sale of indulgences throughout Europe, a practice of which Luther spoke out against. During World War II, the Archbishop of Winnipeg, in a letter dated March 1, 1944, urged Roman Catholic mothers to guarantee the salvation of their sons from purgatory by the payment to him of $40 for prayers and masses in their behalf. No amount of money can pay for our sins or guarantee salvation. It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, when you read Matthew chapter 19, verse 23 and 24. In the Catholic Church, it is easy for the rich to have many masses set for them. The wealthy cannot redeem themselves, as we can read in Psalms chapter 49, verses 6 and 7. We are, quote, not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, unquote, as you can read in First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. When the former Samaritan sorcerer Simon offered money to obtain a gift of God, Peter said literally, quote, To hell with you and your money! How dare you think you could buy the gift of God? Unquote. Acts chapter 8 verse 20 from the J.B. Phillips translation. So this is not the King James and I'm going to give you the King James translation right here. So I'm going to read off Acts chapter 8 from the verses uh, 18 and onwards. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right, in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps he ought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Unquote. Catholic teaching about purgatory, a place for the dead to further pay for their sins before being allowed to enter heaven, is non-biblical, and was not the teachings of Christ or the Apostles. It was not commonly believed until about 600 AD when Pope Gregory created the third state for the purification of souls and did not become actual dogma until the Council of Florence in 1459. Once again, beliefs about a purgatory abound in pagan culture. Plato, who lived between 427 and 347 BC, spoke of a place of torment to make amends for crimes of oneself or one's ancestors. 
Chinese Buddhists came to buy prayers for deliverance of their dead ones from purgatory, from special shops set up for that purpose. Zoroastrians teach of a place of purification. Muslims may escape purgatory by giving money to a religious leader. Israelites were warned not to give money, quote, for the dead, unquote, as you can read in Deuteronomy, chapter 26, verse 14. Alexander Hislop concludes, quote, In every system, therefore, except that of the Bible, the doctrine of purgatory after death and prayers for the dead has always been found to occupy a place, unquote. And for that you can check in Alexander Hislop's monumental work, to Babylon's page 167. Molech worship was an example of various pagan systems which believed that fire was necessary to cleanse one from sin. Israelites were repeatedly forbidden to let their seed, quote, pass through the fire to Molech, unquote, which you can check in Leviticus chapter 18 verse 21. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 35 and the second book of Kings chapter 23 verse 10. Molech, whom some identify with Bel or Nimrod, was worshipped with human sacrifices, purifications, mutilation, vows of celibacy and virginity, etc. Sometimes Molech was represented as an idol with fire inside, so a baby placed in his arms was consumed. Lest the parents should relent, a noise of loud drums was sounded at the moment of fiery sacrifice to hide the screams. The word of, for drums is tophim, from which comes the word tophet, which we can read in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 31. Payments, mutilations and all human efforts are insufficient and worthless in purging our sins. Quote, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Unquote. From Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Is the Pope the vicar of Christ or Antichrist? At the top of the Roman Catholic hierarchy is the Pope, said to be the successor of the Apostle Peter. The entire framework of Roman Catholicism is based on the claim that Peter was Rome's first bishop. Scriptures show an equality among members of the Church. Christ, not the Pope, quote, is the head of the Church, as we can read in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. Religious hierarchies are not godly and condemned by Christ, as we can read in Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 43. We are not to use the flattering title Father. The word Pope means Father. We are not supposed to use the word Rabbi or Master because we are all brethren, as we can read in Matthew chapter 23 verses 4 through 10. The scripture says that Christ, not Peter, is the rock upon which the church is to be built, as you can read in chapter 16 of Matthew and verse 18. Peter himself declared that Christ was the foundation rock in 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 8. The church was built on Christ as you can read in Acts chapter 4 verses 11 through 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11. Not until the time of Calixtus, who was bishop of Rome from AD 218 to 223, was Matthew 16 verse 18 used in an attempt to prove the church was built upon Peter. Peter was not a pope. He was married, as we can read in Matthew chapter 8 verse 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 5. Peter would not allow men to bow down to them, as you can read in Acts chapter 10 verses 25 and 26. Peter did not place tradition on a level with the word of God, as you can read in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18. On the day of Pentecost, Peter did not ask people to have a little water poured on them, but, quote, repent and be baptized or immersed, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, unquote.
quote, as you can read in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter was no pope, for he wore no crown. He was looking forward to the crown of glory at the resurrection, as we can read in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. In short, Peter never acted like a pope, never dressed like a pope, never spoke like a pope, never wrote like a pope, and people did not approach him as a pope. As shown on Pentecost, Peter did take a prominent position of leadership in the early church. His name is always listed among the apostles. Matthew chapter 10 verse 2, Mark chapter 3 verse 16, Luke chapter 6 verse 14 and Acts chapter 1 verse 13. But Paul was not behind the chiefest of the apostles, as we can read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 11. Peter, James and John were pillars in the church, as we can read in Galatians chapter 2 verse 9. Paul wrote 2,325 verses of the New Testament, while Peter wrote only 166 verses. Paul stood up to Peter when he was to be blamed in Galatians chapter 2 verse 11. This would be strange, where Peter an quote-unquote infallible Pope, wouldn't it? Paul was called, quote, the Apostle of the Gentiles, unquote, as we can read in Romans chapter 11, verse 13. Whereas Peter's ministry was primarily to the Jews, as we can read in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. Rome was the chief Gentile city. It is likely that the Apostle Peter never went to Rome, even though tradition says he did, in between AD 42 and 67. Well, tradition says it. And who is the king of tradition? The Pope at the Roman Catholic Church, eh? In 44 AD, Peter was in Jerusalem at the council. About 53 AD, Paul joined him in Antioch, as we can read in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. About AD 58, Paul wrote his letter to the Christians at Rome, greeting 27 persons, but never mentions Peter. There was, however, a Peter who did go to Rome. Details on this story is given in the article Simon Magist by Ernest L. Martin, and I can assure you I will read that article from Ernest L. Martin, some 30-some pages on Simon Magus versus uh, Simon the Sorcerer versus Simon Peter. I will read that in the future on my channel, so look out for that to be coming. Simon the Sorcerer of Samaria was a leader in the mystery religion. The Catholic Encyclopedia admits that Justin Martyr and other early writers inform us that Simon the Sorcerer, in Acts chapter 8 verses 5 through 25, of which partly I read before in the summary already, afterwards went to Rome, worked miracles by the power of demons, received divine honors and Quote, no doubt founded some sort of religion as a counterfeit of Christianity which he claimed to play a part analogous to that of Christ. Unquote. Article of the Impostors, page 699. That quote is taken from. In ancient Chaldea, the supreme pontiff of paganism bore the title Peter, interpreter or opener of the mysteries. The Hebrew word Peter is translated openeth in verses like Exodus chapter 13 verse 2. From Pergamos, on the west coast of what is now Turkey, the headquarters of paganism shifted to Rome. In 63 BC, Roman Emperor Julius Caesar was officially recognized as Pontifex Maximus. Subsequent Roman emperors continued to be heads of the mystery religion until AD 378, when Demasus, Bishop of Rome, was elected Pontifex Maximus. Subsequent popes have continued to hold this pagan title. And you can also go to my readings of Rulers of Evil, where I expound a little bit more on this, especially 48 BC, when Julius Caesar was crowned emperor. And um, that was the first time the Romans deified their emperor, which came from Pergamon, by the way. So, check my readings on the rules of evil for that. Or, go to the book reading of uh, Babylon Mystery Religion, because I probably mentioned that there too, in the chapter where it is appropriate. 
In Mithraism, one of the main branches of mystery religions which came to Rome, the sun god carried two keys. Romans believed in Janus, who held keys. Keys are symbolic of the authority to open and close. Pontiff means bridge maker, one who can open and shut doors. In Matthew chapter 16 verse 19 Christ said, quote, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, unquote. The key given to Peter and all the other disciples was the message of the gospel whereby people could enter the kingdom of God. In pagan religion, however, the keys represented religious rulership over the people, which is contrary to the Bible. The head priest of Mithraism was called Pater Patrum, or Father of Fathers, exactly as the title of the Pope, Papa. Vestments of the Roman clergy are direct legacies from pagan Rome. Dagon, the fish god, Dag in Hebrew means fish, was popular among the heathen Philistines, as we can read in Judges chapter 16 verse 21 through 30 and in the first book of Samuel chapter 5 verse 5 and 6. Priests of Dagon had a fish mitre on their head and a fan-like tail of a fish as part of their garments, just like the Pope and Catholic leaders do today. Processions of the Pope being carried on a chair in full regalia with a giant feather fan are copied from Egyptian priest-king processions. The last Pope who did that, to my knowledge, was uh, Pope Pius XII, carried in a sedia. And I think this picture must have passed your eyes during watching this video. It is no secret that many Popes in the Middle Ages were some of the most sexually vile, evil, wicked, murderous individuals of all time. Pope Boniface VIII, who, lived, who reigned between 1294 and 1303, was singularly wicked, who said, quote, to enjoy oneself and to lie carnally with women or with boys is no more a sin than rubbing one's hands together, unquote. Yet, this was the Pope who in 1302 issued the well-known Unam Sanctum, which officially declared that the Roman Catholic Church is the only true Church, outside of which no one can be saved, and says, quote, We, therefore, assert, define, and pronounce that it is necessary to salvation to believe that every human creature is subject to to the pontiff of Rome. Unquote. Should a sinful pope be obeyed? Here is the official Catholic affirmation. Quote, a sinful pope remains a member of the visible church and is to be treated as a sinful, unjust ruler for whom we must pray, but from whom we may not withdraw our obedience. Unquote. Catholic Encyclopedia, Article Councils. Look it up. The truth is that salvation is not dependent upon a line of wicked men who claim to trace their authority back to Peter. Salvation is found in Christ alone. Now the summary continues. Are popes infallible? Although six popes rejected the idea that popes are infallible, in 1870 the Vatican Council nevertheless made papal infallibility a church dogma. This teaching says that the Roman pontiff, when he speaks ex cathedra, this means in his office, as pastor and teacher of all Christians, <laughs> and Roman Catholics are no Christians, but I don't go any further into that, and defines a doctrine of faith or morals to be held by the entire church, that he is infallible, and consequently such, de such decisions are irreformable. However, Pope after Pope contradicted previous Popes, and Popes have taken for the, to themselves lofty titles such as Most Holy Lord, Vicar of Christ, the Mouth of Jesus Christ, etc. On June 20th, 1894, Pope Leo XIII said, 
quote, We hold upon the earth the place of God Almighty, unquote. As early as 1612, Andreas Helwig pointed out in his book Roman Antichrist that the title Vicar of Christ in Latin, Vicarius Filii Dei, has a numerical value of 603 score and 6. Also see Revelation chapter 13 verse 18. Numerous other names and titles add up to the same auspicious number. The original name of Rome was Saturnia, the secret name revealed only to initiates of the Chaldean mysteries, which in Chaldean was spelled S-T-U-R, stir. In their language, S represented 60, T was 400, U was 6, and R was 200, for a total of 603 score and 6. Nero Caesar in Hebrews comes to 666. The Greek letters of the word Latinos, which means Latin, comes to 666, as well as the Hebrew of Romulus, Romieth, the founder of Rome. The six letters which make up the Roman numeral system also add up to 666, because you have D for 500, C for 100, L for 50, X for 10, V for 5, and I for 1. The letter M was a double D added later, as you can learn when you follow my book reading of the whole book of Babylon Mystery Religion. In the Bible itself we read that each year King Solomon received 603 score and 6 talents of gold in 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 14. Wealth played an important part in leading him astray. In the New Testament the letters of the Greek word euporia translated wealth in Acts chapter 19 verse 25 add up to 603 score and 6, as does the word paradosis, translated tradition in Matthew 15, verse 2. Wealth and tradition were the two great corruptors of the Roman Catholic Church then and now. Wealth corrupted practice and honesty. Tradition corrupted doctrine. And you know, Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And who has absolute power over the earth today? Inquisition, then and now, to the next chapter. Numerous popes promulgated bulls, official documents which encouraged torture and murder of those who opposed the Roman Catholic religious system. The methods of gruesome torture devised during the period of the Inquisition are a testimony to the corrupt influence of satanically inspired human beings apart from God. Ten thousand Huguenots, French Protestants, were killed in the bloody Paris massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day in 1572. I think the numbers are even higher than 70,000, not 10,000 during the whole week that killing went on. The French king went to Mass to return solemn thanks that so many quote-unquote heretics were slain. I read that, I know that, in the book. The papal court rejoiced at the news, and Pope Gregory XIII's in grand procession went to the church of St. Louis to offer thanks. Inquisition was ordered by papal decree and confirmed by Pope after Pope, between 1203 and 1805. This does not detract from Hitler's Pope Pius XII, who abetted the Nazi regime. Hitler would never have come to power had it not been for Catholic support. While Jews and others died in Nazi concentration camps, the Pope and others who knew what was going on were silent. And after the war, the Church was instrumental in helping Nazis to escape via the infamous Vatican Red Lines. And for that you can also turn to my reading Behind the Dictators, where the whole situation, the connection between Roman Catholicism and Nazi fascism is lined out. There appears to be nothing new, no change of heart in the Roman system. 
Repentance, not political apologies, is the only avenue for those enmeshed in the Romish system of Babylon. The way to repent for papists is to renounce the Babylonish system, to come out of her, as you can read in chapter 18 of Revelation verse 4. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of, the, of her sins, and so on. The next chapter is called Lords over God's Heritage. The highest ranking officials of the Roman Catholic Church next to the Pope are cardinals. You won't find cardinals mentioned in the Bible. The original cardinals were a group of leading priests in the ancient pagan religion of Rome, long before the Christian era. The word cardinal comes from the Latin cardo, meaning hinge, those who were pivotal leaders. They were priests of Janus, the pagan god of door and hinges. Even today, the word janitor, a keeper of doors, comes from Janus, known as, quote, the opener and shutter, unquote. As we know, only Christ opens and shuts doors, as you can read in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. And Hislop reports, quote, the college of cardinals with the Pope at its head, is just the counterpart of the pagan college of pontiffs, which its Pontifex Maximus, or sovereign pontiff, which is known to have been framed on the model of the grand original council of pontiffs at Babylon, unquote, from the two Babylons, page 206. Cardinals wear red garments. It is not surprising that images of Chaldeans had vermilion, bright red. From ancient times, red or scarlet has been associated with sin, as we can read in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Adultery is sometimes called the scarlet sin, and houses of prostitution are in the red light district. Bishops are mentioned in the Bible, but here again, Catholic tradition perverts the truth. The word cathedral comes from cathedra, meaning throne. A cathedral, unlike other churches, is one in which the throne of a bishop is located. You can read Acts chapter 20 verse 17 and 28, Titus chapter 1 verse 5 and 7, and that indicates that bishops, elders, pastors, overseers are the same office. Each church had several elders who were also bishops. We are warned to avoid the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which comes from the word nikao, to conquer, and laos, laity, which refers to the notion of a priestly order over the people. Peter instructs church leaders not to be, quote, lords over God's heritage, unquote, as we can read in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. The word translated heritage is kleron, which means clergy. All spirit-begotten children of God are his heritage, his clergy. God has a ministry for all his people, not just a special priestly class. Elders, plural, are to be ordained in every city, as we can read in Acts chapter 14, verses 19 through 23, and in James chapter 5, verse 14. We believers are a royal priesthood, as we can read in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 and 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. We are not to give flattering titles to religious leaders, as you can read in Job chapter 32 verse 21 and Matthew chapter 23 verses 9 through 12. Pope is a variation of the title Father. Catholic priests are called Fathers. And so it was that in one of the leading branches of the mystery religion which came to Rome, Mithraism, the priests were called fathers, and the head priest, who always lived at Rome, was called pater patrum, father of fathers. Since Christ told us not to call religious leaders fathers, or to call no man on earth father but the one who is in heaven, and pagan priests of Rome used this title, did the Catholics get this practice from the Bible, or did they get it 
from paganism? You answer the question. The Bible gives us an example of how pagan priests being called Father in Judges chapter 17 verse 10. Catholics use the title Monsignor, meaning My Lord. One of the meanings of Arch is Master, and Catholics use titles such as Archbishop, Archpriest, and Archdeacon. Not to be outdone, English clergy uses titles such as The Reverend, The Right Reverend, The Most High Reverend, etc., while the Bible uses Reverend only in reference to God Himself, as you can read in Psalm 111, verse 9. Sexual excesses goes hand in hand with celibacy. Strange as it, as it sounds, it is said that Queen Semiramis invented clerical celibacy, as you can read in Hislop's book on page 219. When the worship of Cybele, the Babylonian goddess, was introduced into pagan Rome, it came in its primitive form, with its celibate clergy. As in pagan times, temple celibates were actually involved in licentious sexual practices. Quote unquote, forbidding to marry led to sexual license. This has shown its ugly head many times during the history of the Roman Catholic Church, although doubtless many priests have been faithful to their vows of celibacy. Forbidding priests to marry, contrary to 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 3, along with the practice of the confessional, was bound to cause some weak individuals to sin. There is a tremendous power that a priest has over someone that is bound to divulge their sins to a priest, a practice held to be necessary for salvation. The Bible says we should confess our faults one to another in James chapter 5 verse 16, not to a priest. The idea of confessing to a priest came not from the Bible, but from Babylon. Secret confession was required before complete initiation was granted into the Babylonian mysteries. Such priestly confession was practiced in Medo-Persia, Egypt and Rome long before the Christian era. Almost everywhere you look at the Romish system you find pagan origins. Even the usual black color of clergy garments worn by priests and some Protestants follows the custom of the priests of Baal, Kemarims, who wore black garments, as you can read in Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 4 in the second book of Kings chapter 23 verse 5. As Adam Clark notes, they were called Kemarim from Kamar, which means dark, black. He says that Jews today call Christians, Christian missionaries Kemarim because of their black clothes and garments. Another practice of the Catholic priesthood is that of tonsure, the rite of shaving the top of the head in a round circle. Buddhists, priests, the priests of Osiris of Egypt, priests of Bacchus and Mithra priests also practice tonsure the round tonjo imitating a solar disk. Such was forbidden, of course, of God's people. Quote, they shall not make baldness upon their head. Unquote. As you can read in Leviticus chapter 21 verse 5 and chapter 19 verse 27. Any similarity between the Catholic ministry and hierarchy and true ministers of God is purely accidental. We come to the idolatrous mass. The Catholic Encyclopedia states, quote, In the celebration of the Holy Mass, the bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ. It is called transubstantiation, for in the sacrament of the Eucharist the substance of bread and wine do not remain, but the entire substance of bread is changed into the body of Christ, and the entire substance of wine is changed into his blood. The species or outward semblance of bread and wine alone remaining. Unquote. You can read that on the article Consecration in the Catholic Encyclopedia. 
Jesus, in his last Passover meal with the disciples, said of the bread, quote, Take, eat, this is my body. And of the cup, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood. Unquote. Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28. Was this meant to be taken literally or symbolically? Well, the Bible, as always, answers clearly. When some of David's men risked their lives to bring him water from Bethlehem, he refused it, saying, quote, Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Unquote. As you can read in the second book of Je uh, Samuel, chapter 23, verse 17. The Bible speaks of Jesus as, quote, A door, wine, and a rock as you can read in John chapter 10 verse 9, chapter 15 verse 5, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. And we recognize these statements as figurative and symbolic. If the wine of the communication table became actual blood, to drink it would be forbidden by the Bible, as you can read in Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 16 and Acts chapter 15 verse 20. Many Christian martyrs have lost their lives rather than partake of the idolatrous mass in which the priest claims to literally have the power to create God. The Council of Trent proclaimed that belief in transubstantiation was essential to salvation. In offering up the mass, the priest believes he is actually sacrificing Christ, a renewal of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. The Bible, however, says Christ gave his life by one sacrifice forever. And you can read for confirmation Hebrews chapter 10 verses 10 through 14, chapter 9 verses 25 through 28. After the priest blesses the bread, thinks he changes it into Christ, he places a wafer in the center of a sunburst stand called the monstrance. Catholics bow and worship this wafer God. Likewise, in Egypt, a cake was consecrated by a priest and was supposed to become the flesh of Osiris. Similar rites occurred in Mithraism and in ancient Mexico. Heathen priests ate a portion of all sacrifices. In cases of human sacrifice, priests of Baal were required to eat human flesh. Thus, we have the word cannibal, which comes from Kahan Baal, priest of Baal. The waver of Eucharist is round. Jesus, at his last Passover, merely broke the unleavened bread, which does not break into round pieces. Round wafers are another symbol of Baal, or the sun. Round cakes were used in the ancient mysteries of Egypt, Mithraism, and elsewhere. Sun images adorn the top of the famous Baldachinum, the 95-foot high canopy inside the Vatican. Israelite reformers broke down the altars of Baal and the sun images, <coughs> as we can read in Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 4. The round Eucharist wafers often have a cross on them, exactly as Assyrian wafers used in worship. Passover is observed at night, but Catholics usually observe Mass in the early morning, similar to Mithraists who observe their sacred meetings in the early morning, in honor of the S.U.N. Sun. Contrast the elaborate ritual of the idolatrous Catholic Mass to the simple Christian Passover. We come to three days and three nights. In chapter 18, Ralph Woodrow provides clear proof for a Wednesday crucifixion, Sabbath resurrection with Jesus in the tomb exactly three days and three nights, 72 hours, as he said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. The strongest proof of this fact is Mark chapter 16, verse 1, and Luke chapter 23, verse 56. In Mark chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, we read, quote, And when the Sabbath was passed, Maria Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. 
And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. Unquote. The interlinear Bible shows that bought rather than had bought is the proper translation. Note that it is bought, not brought. It was after the Sabbath when these women bought their spices. Then Luke Chapter 23, verse 56 reports that after seeing Jesus' body in the sepulchre, the woman, quote, returned and prepared spices and ointments, and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment, unquote. There were two Sabbaths in question here. The annual Sabbath, the first day of unleavened bread, as you can see in John chapter 19, verses 14 and 31, and the weekly seventh day week Sabbath. Jesus kept the 14th path over on Tuesday evening. He was crucified and buried on Wednesday, Passover day. Thursday was the high day annual Sabbath. The woman bought burial spices on Friday, prepared them and then rested on the weekly Sabbath. On the first day of the week, they came to anoint Jesus' body, but found the tomb empty, because he was already risen. Surely, the commonly accepted Good Friday, Easter Sunday resurrection, is a false tradition of men, of the Roman Catholic Church. Fish on Friday and Easter customs we continue. The Catholic practice of abstaining from red meat on Friday and instead eating fish on Friday is derived from their false teaching of a Friday crucifixion. Scriptures never associate fish with Friday. The word Friday comes from Freya, the Teutonic fertility goddess symbolized by fish, who lay prolific amounts of eggs. Freya is the same as the Roman Venus, goddess of fertility, for whom the fish was regarded as sacred. Likewise, in the Israelite worship of Ashtoreth and Egyptian worship of Isis, the fish symbolized the fertility goddess. In Acts chapter 12 verse 4, quote-unquote, Easter is a mistranslation. Well, I do not think so. And I will tell you right here why. Because that Easter refers to the pagan feast of Easter and has nothing to do with the Passover. So I will leave this part out of uh, the by another person written summary here because I do not agree with that Easter is a mistranslation. It is a right translation. It is to make us aware of the feast of Easter, the pagans had at that time. Read carefully through it. You can write me a note on that, but I have had an intense Bible study with Tom Fress for Inquisition Update on this, and we absolutely agree that this one time Easter is mentioned in the Bible there is absolutely reasonable and points to the pagan feast of Easter. Anyway, sunrise worship has long been associated with paganism. From Japanese Shintoists to pagan Mithrists of Rome, meeting together to worship facing the rising sun has long been practiced. Priests of Baal first began their worship in the morning, as you can read in the first book of Kings, chapter 18, verse 26. The Bible condemns pagan sun worship in Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 16. Jesus was not selected at sunrise on Sunday morning, but just before sunset on Saturday afternoon, Sabbath afternoon. Once again, pagan customs have been freely incorporated into Catholic worship practice. Legend has it that Tammuz was killed by a wild boar when he was 40 years old. Forty days were set aside to weep for Tammuz with fasting, weeping, and self-chastisement. You can see Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 14 on this. The, this observance was not known only in Babylon, but also among the Phoenicians, 
Egyptians, Mexicans, and for a time even among the Israelites. The Catholic Encyclopedia admits there are no apostolic observances of Lent, which was not commanded by the Pope until the 6th century BC, when Catholics were ordered not to eat meat for 40 days of Lent. And we come to the Feast of Christmas. The word Christmas is a con con <laughs> the word Christmas is a contradictory word. It links Christ, the Son of God, with Mass, the idolatrous and blasphemous Roman Catholic ritual. Jesus could not have been born on December 25th. Shepherds in Judea brought their flocks in for the winter before the end of October. The Catholic Encyclopedia admits, quote, Christmas was not among the earliest festivals of the Church. Irenaeus and Tertullian omitted from their lists of feasts, unquote. It was not until late of the 4th century when the Roman Church began observing December 25th. Coincidentally, the date chosen for the birth of Christ was on the same date as the birth of Saul, the pagan Sun sun-guard from Mithraism. The winter solstice festival of Rome, the Saturnalia, influenced many Christmas, Christmas customs, including the giving of gifts. Note that the wise men presented gifts to Jesus, not to themselves. And they came not when he was lying in the manger, but when he was in a house, as you can read in Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. The Christmas tree has its roots in pagan tree worship. <laughs> you also have modern tree worship with the Gaia movement, but that's another thing. An old Babylonian fable told of an evergreen tree which sprang out of a dead tree stump. The old stump symbolized the dead Nimrod, and the new evergreen tree symbolized that Nimrod had come back to life again in Tammuz. In Rome, the sacred fir was decorated with red berries during the Saturnalia. In at least ten biblical references, including First Book of Kings, chapter 14, verse 23, the green tree is associated with idolatry and false worship. Jeremiah chapter 10 verses 3 through 4 seems to be referring to a type of Christmas tree used in pagan worship. Although probably well intentioned, many who observe Christmas customs today ignore the clear facts that most of these customs have pagan origins and we are told not to follow the ways of the heathen in Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 29 through 32. And let me add one other thing. In the time when the United States of America still consisted out of 13 colonies, and even the time after that, and you can find proof for that in yourself, the celebration of Christmas was forbidden because it was superstitious and idolatrous. Look it up for yourselves. you got some research to do on your own, I think. Pagan festivals or God's holy days? What do we do? The pagan origin of Easter, Christmas, Valentine's Day, Halloween and a host of other Catholic holy days is so well known that we should need little review. Any encyclopedia or newspaper during these seasons usually gives well-documented facts. <laughs> but who reads these? These holidays were borrowed directly from paganism, with a little brushing off to make them appear Christian. And so it is that God's holy days are often neglected, while worldly holidays of pagan origin appear to be more appealing to carnal humanity. And today in the Church of God there is a curious longing to return to what we came out of. The mixture of paganism and some Bible truth is deadly poison. This is the cup which the Babylonian system has made all the world to drink. It is not limited to the Roman Catholic Church of Rome, but she certainly plays a major role in today's religious deception. Coming to the last chapter 
a poisonous mixture, or as it is called, the mystery of the mixture in the original book. The Romish system is based upon a mixture. That was the same as the apostasy into which the Israelites repeatedly fell. So it's not the first time in history, eh? Usually Israel did not reject outright the worship of the true God, but mixed heathen rites with it, mixing the holy with the profane. When they worshipped the golden calf, the Israelites claimed it was a quote-unquote feast to the Lord, as you can read in Exodus chapter 32, verse 5. Not content with the tabernacle of God, they added the tabernacle of Moloch and Kiwin with pagan images. You can read Amos chapter 5 verse 26 and Acts chapter 7 verses, 24, uh, verses 42 and 43. At another period, Israel performed secret rites, built high places and groves, used divination, caused their children to pass through the fire, and worshipped the sun, moon, and stars, as you can read in the second book of Kings, chapter 17, verses 9 through 17. And when I read this chapter um, of the book, I read the whole chapter 17 of second Kings. So for a good understanding, turn to that upload. As a result, but you, you know, you should do that anyway because this is just a summary so to give you an idea what the book is about. <laughs> okay. As a result, God allowed them to be expelled from their land. Mixture was apparent during the time of both judges and kings. At the time of Ezekiel, an idol was placed right at the entrance of the Jerusalem temple. Some even sacrificed their children and came that very day to the sanctuary, as you can read in Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 20, uh, verses 38 and 39. Jeremiah's message was aimed at people who claimed, quote, to worship the Lord, as you can read in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 2, but had mixed in pagan rites, quote, Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Ye burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods. Make cakes to the Queen of Heaven, and come and stand before me in this house. Unquote. As you can read in Jeremiah chapter 7, between the verses 8 through 18. The Eternal does not accept religious mixtures. Our God does not accept compromise. If Baal be God, then serve him. But if the God of the Bible is God, then serve him. As you can read in the first book of Kings, chapter 18, verse 21. God was not pleased with the religious mixture then, nor is he now. As Samuel preached, quote, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth, which is the pagan mother goddess worship, from among you, and prepare your heart unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you. Unquote. As you can read in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3. Today, many believe that the Roman system has changed. With Vatican II, non-Catholic professing Christians are not considered heretics, but, quote-unquote, separated brethren. Don't kid yourselves. Satan appears as an angel of light, as you can read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Jesus warned about, quote-unquote, wolves in sheep's clothing in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. The same Babylon mystery system has always oppressed free men who seek to serve God in sincerity and truth. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge that is available to them, as you can read in Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. Come out of her, my people, Revelation 18 verse 4, and let us earnestly contend for the true faith once delivered to the saints as you can read in Jude 3. Ralph Woodrow concludes his excellent book, Babylon Mystery Religion, with this stirring summary. Quote, we believe the true Christian goal is not religion based on mixture, but a return to the original 
simple, powerful, and spiritual faith that was once delivered to the saints. No longer entangling ourselves in a maze of rituals or powerless traditions, we can find the simplicity that is in Christ, rejoicing in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free from bondage. Unquote. And the two quotes from the Bible were taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 and Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Salvation is not dependent on a human priest, Mary, the saints, or the Pope. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Unquote. As you can read in John chapter 14, verse 6. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. As you can read in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Let us look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, the apostle and high priest of our profession, the Lamb of God, the captain of our salvation, the bread from heaven, the water of life, the good shepherd, the prince of peace, the king of kings, and Lord of lords. May the Almighty guide us to come totally out of Babylon. Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off. God bless you and bye-bye.